Hello, everyone, and welcome to another recorded lecture of Bio 1 Online. Today, we will continue and finish our conversation on Chapter 7, which is discussing DNA structure and gene function. So we're going to focus mostly on gene expression. So we know that the genome of an organism has all the genes required for it to function. Right? We said that the human genome specifically has over 20,000 genes that encode for specific proteins that we need to function. So are all the genes in a genome expressed in every cell? Does every single one of our cells make over 20,000 different proteins? Right? Does that mean that every single gene gets transcribed and translated into a functional product? The answer is no. Only certain genes are expressed in specific cell types and at specific times. So gene expression is highly regulated in all organisms. Right? A gene has been expressed when its product, which is usually a protein, is made and is operating in the cell. So gene expression controls which proteins and which enzymes are made, and those should only be produced as needed. For example, a python that is about to swallow up a gazelle is going to start producing a lot of digestive enzymes as it begins to swallow it. It doesn't need to make digestive enzymes if there were no gazelle to eat. All right, so proteins in organisms are only produced as needed. Prokaryotes are the simplest organisms, and they regulate several genes at once. So we'll talk about prokaryotic gene expression first, um, very quickly, actually. And we'll focus a lot more on eukaryotic gene expression. So bacteria, like the ones in our gut, only produce enzymes when they're needed. And genes in prokaryotes are organized into what we call operons. They're groups of genes that are always transcribed together. One operon is called the LAC operon, and that has three different genes that are needed to break down lactose. Lactose is a sugar, um, so E. coli needs certain enzymes to absorb and degrade that sugar, right? lactose. But how does the bacteria know when to make those enzymes only when lactose is present? Right? This is really, really interesting. Right? Why would the bacteria want to make enzymes that break down lactose if there's no lactose to break down? So prokaryotes regulate gene expression at the lac operon. The promoter, if you recall, is the region of DNA where RNA polymerase binds to initiate transcription. Right next to it is a, a section of DNA called the operator. And that's where a special regulatory protein can bind and affect the activity of RNA polymerase at the promoter. So the promoter and the operator are the starting point for gene expression in prokaryotes. And this is where it gets interesting. When lactose is absent, lactose digesting enzymes are not needed. We don't want these enzymes to be made, right? The cell would be actually wasting energy making enzymes that have no function. So what happens is normally in the cell, when there's no lactose present, a repressor protein binds to the operator. Right, here's the operator, here's a repressor protein, and this stops transcription by stopping RNA polymerase from moving forward. RNA polymerase cannot transcribe these three genes to break down lactose because this repressor is there. And the repressor is normally bound to the operator. However, only when lactose is present, when lactose is present in the cell, it can bind to the repressor and changes the repressor's shape. And when lactose is bound to the repressor, it cannot bind to the operator anymore. That allows RNA polymerase to transcribe the genes and those genes will then get um, translated from mRNA into protein so that enzymes that break down lactose are produced. So this is again, very interesting, very smart feedback. Only when lactose is present will enzymes to break down lactose be expressed. When lactose is no longer present, then no, these enzymes won't be made anymore because there's no more lactose to break down. So the two French biologists, um, Jacob and Monod, who discovered um, the operon, the lac operon, concluded that the genome contains not only a series of blueprints, but a coordinated program of protein synthesis 
and means of controlling its execution. So we see that in prokaryotes, so we have even more complexity in eukaryotes. So now we'll continue by talking about eukaryotic gene expression. So in eukaryotes, do most somatic cells contain the same genes? Somatic cells are body cells. So do most of your body cells contain the same genes? What do you think? The answer is yes. Almost all of your body cells, with the exception of um, immune cells, which produce different antibodies and are not genetically identical, with the exception of those, all of your body cells have the same genes. Your hair cells, your eye cells, your muscle cells have all the same genes as your skin cells. So not all cells express the same genes, right? We said almost all somatic cells have the same exact genes, but only certain genes are expressed into mRNAs and proteins depending on the cell type. For example, all cells in our body have the genes for alcohol metabolism and for neurotransmitters, but not all cells express those genes. For example, a hair cell needs neither alcohol metabolism, enzymes, or neurotransmitters. In a liver cell, you would need to break down alcohol. So the alcohol dehydrogenase gene would be turned on, and that would be expressed into RNA and proteins in a liver cell. A neurotransmitter gene is still present in the nucleus of a liver cell, but it's not going to be turned on. We don't need RNA to be made from a neurotransmitter gene because we don't want neurotransmitter proteins in a liver cell. Compare that to a neuron. In a neuron, inside the nucleus, we still have an alcohol dehydrogenase gene and a neurotransmitter gene, but in a neuron, only the neurotransmitter gene will be turned on and expressed so we can make actual neurotransmitters. Right? We don't want the alcohol dehydrogenase gene expressed in a neuron. Right? So not all cells express the same genes. That's what makes cells different. And while each cell has a unique package of mRNAs and proteins, all cells have a group of proteins called housekeeping proteins in common. Right? These are needed for any cell just to upkeep, like just housekeeping for general life itself. All cells need housekeeping proteins to survive. So these are proteins that would be for like building proteins. Like all cells need ribosomes. All cells need proteases. All cells need cytoskeletal proteins like actin and tubulin. All cells need RNA polymerase. All right? So regardless of whether you're a blood cell, a hair cell, a muscle cell, an eye cell, you still need to have a skeleton. You still need to make proteins. You still need to break down things. So housekeeping proteins are found in all cells. I want to use this uh, table to just check your understanding very quickly. Would a heart cell contain heart genes? It would, right? Would it have heart proteins? Of course, because that's what makes it a heart cell. Would a heart cell have skin genes? Yes. Does it make skin proteins? No, it does not. Does it make, does it have neuronal genes? Yes, it does. Does it make neuronal proteins? No, it does not. Does it have housekeeping proteins? Yes. So I want you to pause here and go through that for the next three types of cells, whether they would contain any of these genes and proteins. So you can pause here and I'll reveal the answer. So again, make sure this is clear before moving on. So there are several mechanisms that control eukaryotic gene expression. And we can talk for hours about this. And in a future biology class, we will talk for hours about it. But for now, we're gonna break it down and make it as simple as possible. So there are signals from outside and inside of the cell that can regulate which genes are expressed and when. So from the outside, we have hormones and different growth factors and chemical signals that can interact with the cell, usually through membrane receptor proteins, telling the cell what to, what to express, what to turn on or what to turn off. Inside of the cell, gene expression is dependent on nutrient levels, ATP levels, and how healthy the cell is. But that can also dictate which genes are turned on and off. We can break down gene expression into five basic levels. You don't have to list these, like you're not gonna be tested. What are the five primary levels of control? But I want you to understand how each of these impacts gene expression. In the nucleus, we're gonna talk about chromatin structure and how that affects gene expression. 
right? Whether RNA polymerase can even access a gene will determine whether that gene can be expressed. We'll talk about transcriptional control, right? Which genes are actually transcribed by RNA polymerase? Once those genes are transcribed by RNA polymerase, which of those mRNAs are spliced properly? How are they after, um, how are the mRNAs protected? Are they stable enough so they can be translated by ribosomes? Right, we know that they have to be capped and tailed and processed and everything. And finally, once translation is complete, once there's even a protein, which proteins are kept active and which are inactivated or destroyed? So all together, right, we know it's not just enough to have a gene in the nucleus. You have to have all these things working out for the gene to be expressed into a functional protein product. So eukaryotes start their gene regulation in the nucleus, determining whether that DNA is even available for RNA polymerase to transcribe. And this, again, starts with chromatin structure. And regardless of the gene sequences themselves, the chromatin structure can regulate which genes are expressed epigenetically. Epigenetically means above genetic. This is telling us that just because a gene is present, depending on the form of that gene, right, depending on the form of that chromatin, that will determine whether that gene can be expressed, the actual structure of that gene. So this is epigenetics, right? The field of epigenetics is the study of how different gene modifications can turn genes temporarily on or off. So the definition of, of epigenetics is evolving, but biologists agree that it concerns changes in gene expression that do not involve changes to the DNA sequence itself. That's key, right? We can change gene expression without changing the gene sequence itself. And that's why this is a very new and up and coming field of epigenetics. You know, why, why your DNA isn't your destiny, right? Just because you have a gene doesn't mean that you're going to express that gene. So let's rewind and talk about chromatin. And we're talking about epi epigenetics talks about the structure of chromatin and how the structure of chromatin impacts gene expression. And we said that chromatin consists of DNA wrapped around histone proteins. There are two forms of chromatin. U-chromatin is loosely wrapped DNA. So DNA is loosely wrapped around histones. And those genes are actively expressed. You can remember euchromatin, E euchromatin are expressed. Heterochromatin is tightly wrapped DNA, and heterochromatin is not actively expressed. So I want you to think about this. How do you think the structure of chromatin can impact gene expression? Right? What is the tightness or the looseness of wrapping around histones? Um, what does that have to do with gene expression? Well, the structure of chromatin will dictate whether RNA polymerase can bind to the promoter and initiate transcription. That's the key. Depending on how tightly the DNA is wrapped around histones, RNA polymerase may or may not transcribe the gene. Suppose the DNA is tightly wrapped around histones in the form of heterochromatin, very tightly condensed DNA. This promoter will be very hard to access by RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase will not be able to read the promoter and then transcribe the gene. However, if DNA is loosely wrapped around histones, then this promoter is very easy to read by RNA polymerase and the gene can be expressed. So when chromatin is tightly packed as heterochromatin, gene promoters are blocked and genes cannot be transcribed. When chromatin is loosely packed, RNA polymerase is able to bind the promoter the DNA will be able to be transcribed into mRNA, and that mRNA will then be able to be translated into a protein. So I wanted to show you a quick, you can click on these links. I'm going to direct you to one of these now. So here I have a gene for GFP, for green fluorescent protein. And what you're seeing here is the gene for GFP, the instructions that can encode for this fluorescent protein, is wrapped around histones. GFP is what allows jellyfish and sea anemones to glow, for example. So what I want to show you 
is depending on how tightly the GFP gene is wrapped around histones. That will determine how much GFP mRNA can be transcribed and how much GFP protein can be translated. And that will determine the fluorescence of the cell. So let's wrap GFP as tightly as possible. In this case, RNA polymerase will have a very hard time finding the promoter of GFP. So very little mRNA will be made. Therefore, very, very few uh, GFP proteins will be made and the cell will barely glow. Let's loosen it a little bit. Right, so RNA polymerase will have a much easier time transcribing and translating the gene. And now I'm going to slowly increase the, um, the looseness. So it's getting looser and looser. And here we have the maximum amount of mRNA, protein, and fluorescence when it's loosely wrapped. So now that you understand how the looseness or the tightness of chromatin impacts gene expression, what determines how tightly DNA is even wrapped around histones to begin with? Well, it turns out that there are two chemical changes to chromatin that can either loosen it or tighten it. And these changes are temporary. There are two different chemicals you have to be familiar with. Methylation is the addition of a methyl group, which is just carbon and three hydrogens. And when methyl groups are added to chromatin, DNA is wrapped tightly around histones. Within acetyl group, which is again carbon with hydrogens with an oxygen present, DNA is wrapped loosely around histones. So again, these are just chemicals. When a methyl chemical is added to DNA or chromatin. DNA is wrapped tightly around histones, thus making it not expressed. The genes will not be expressed. When chromatin is acetylated, that means DNA will be wrapped loosely around the histones, and those genes could be expressed when genes are acetylated. So think about what would demethylation do? Right? Demethylation would increase gene expression. What would deacetylation do? Right, if you remove acetyl groups, that would cause it to tighten the wrapping around histones. So these changes are always going and change, going and coming. Right, DNA could be methylated for one hour and then acetylated the next, and this is again allowing temporary changes in gene expression. Now you can remember, acetylation spaces histones out. Right. So again, in order to go from chromatin, uh, heterochromatin to euchromatin, what has to happen? What kind of histone modifications? We would need to either do histone acetylation or demethylation. To go from euchromatin to heterochromatin, we would need to do um, deacetylation or methylation. And what adds these methyl or acetyl groups are special enzymes. You don't have to know the specific enzymes, but enzymes called histone acetyl transferases transfer acetyl groups to histones, whereas other enzymes called HDOCs, histone deacetylation um, acetylation complexes, remove um, acetyl groups. So again, enzymes add these chemicals that can either loosen DNA wrapping around histones or tighten the DNA wrapping around histones. And depending on how tightly the DNA is wrapped around histones will determine whether RNA polymerase can transcribe the genes. Up until this point, all the methylation and acetylation was done to the histones themselves, but it's also possible for the nucleotides of DNA to be methylated. Specifically, cytosines of DNA can be methylated. And in um, embryogenesis, as our embryos form, certain genes are turned off in, in the dad's um, chromosomes and certain genes are turned on in the mom's chromosomes. So you don't have double dosing of certain genes. So DNA methylation part is part of genomic imprinting. 
um, which basically says only certain genes will be expressed from mom, certain genes will be expressed from dad as you develop in the womb. So pause here, try to answer this question. So the larva gene is found in all of us. The larva gene is responsible for lactation and pregnancy, um, in females after pregnancy. What form do you think the larva gene is in for most of a cell's lifetime? Right, it's in heterochromatin form most of the time. In a male, it's in heterochromatin form all the time. But in response, um, no, I should say in response to the hormones of uh, pregnancy and of delivery, then the female will start turning on the gene for lactation. So prolactin is a hormone, we won't go into endocrinology, but prolactin is a hormone that could be sent throughout the body and could turn on the genes in mammary cells um, that are responsible for lactation. What do you think the gene is for most of the cell's lifetime? Would it be mostly methylated or acetylated? It would be mostly methylated. Again, until that cell, until that gene is needed to be expressed, then it will be acetylated, which will be loose, loosely wrapped so that RNA polymerase can make the larva protein. So after we're born, those tags, those chemical tags on our chromosomes change throughout our life in response to many different environmental factors. So depending on what we eat, our stress levels, our exposure uh, to toxins in the environment, those can shift gene expression. And this is very um, apparent when you look at identical twins. So identical twins are clones of each other in that they have matching DNA, right? They have the same exact DNA in every single cell. But what's interesting is that just because identical twins share the same DNA, it doesn't mean they're exactly the same. Right? No two identical twins are exactly the same. This graph I could talk about for a very long time, but I'll try to talk about it in 20 seconds, um, shows different genetic traits or traits that have a genetic component. And it shows the percentage of twin pairs that share the trait. And you're looking at identical twins in white, fraternal twins in gray. So what you're showing here, this is saying, this white bar is saying with height, 90% of identical twin pairs have exactly the same height. So 90% of the time, when one twin is five feet tall, the other twin is exactly five feet tall. But 10% of the time, that's not the case. So clearly, just because you have the same exact genes for height, 10% of the time, even having the same exact genes doesn't give you the same height. So there must be something in the environment that's playing a role. But let's compare the height concordance with identical uh, with fraternal twins. And fraternal twins are no more related than any brother and sister. And this is saying that about 60% of fraternal twins where one is five foot tall, the other is five foot tall. So clearly there is a genetic component because when you have exactly the same DNA, you have a 30% increase in having the same exact height as your twin compared to just having 50% of the DNA. But let's take that to an example of like diabetes. Diabetes is clearly not that genetic because even if two twins, identical twins have the same exact DNA, only about 30% of the time will both twins have diabetes. So there's a huge environmental influence on diabetes, a huge epigenetic influence, right? That is outside of genetics. But we can say that diabetes does have a genetic influence because compared to fraternal twins, there's hardly any concordance in fraternal twins. So having the same exact DNA does play a role in the concordance of diabetes. And again, you could take that to look at breast cancer, Crohn's disease, arthritis, um, all these disorders or traits um, have both a genetic component and an environmental component. And those that are up here have more genetic influence than those down here. So you can help shape your epigenome right? Depending on the chemicals we're exposed to, the diet, our stress, our social situations, exercise, that can help uh, regulate and modulate our epigenome. And some of the foods we eat can make um, temporary changes to histones. So even apples and grapes, things that we eat every day, 
can temporarily impact gene expression changes. DNA contains the instructions for building all the parts of the body. But DNA is only half the story. The DNA in our bodies is wrapped around proteins called histones. Both the DNA and histones are covered with chemical tags. This second layer of structure is called the epigenome. The epigenome shapes the physical structure of the genome. It tightly wraps inactive genes, making them unreadable. It relaxes active genes, making them easily accessible. Different sets of genes are active in different cell types. The DNA code remains fixed for life, but the epigenome is flexible. Epigenetic tags react to signals from the outside world, such as diet and stress. The epigenome adjusts specific genes in our genomic landscape in response to our rapidly changing environment. So I'd like you to watch this Nova clip. Um, that talks a little bit about epigenetics and some of the really interesting experiments in humans and in animals that are being done to understand um, how epigenetics control our lives. So there's a really interesting case about um, identical twin sisters, um, one who has cancer and one who does not. And then it discusses these um, mice that are otherwise identical, except one was fed a different diet and causes this obesity. And this, again, this little talk will discuss how just because having the same genes doesn't mean you're going to express them the same way. So please click on this link below. So which of the following would increase transcription? There are two possible answers. Please pause now. The answer is B and C would increase transcription, whether it's acetylated or demethylated, right? And when I'm saying DNA, I'm real, it should be chromatin, right? Chromatin includes DNA or histones. Which of the following would decrease transcription? Right, that would be A and D. So now we can talk about the next level of gene expression control, transcriptional control. And as we've just seen, DNA can only be expressed if it's loosely wrapped around histones. And even then, RNA polymerase can only bind to a promoter and start transcription of a gene if certain things are present in the nucleus. All right, so how does RNA polymerase know which genes to transcribe? It's not just gonna randomly transcribe any gene that's loosely wrapped, right? So not only do the genes have to be loosely wrapped, but there also needs to be transcription factors present. So transcription is controlled by transcription factors. Transcription factors are proteins that bind DNA at specific sequences that regulate transcription. Specifically, we're going to talk about transcription factors that recruit RNA polymerase to the proper promoters. Remember that every gene starts with a promoter sequence. So transcription factors will tell RNA polymerase, depending on which cell it's in, which genes promoters to start transcription at. So different transcription factors can either help attract or repel RNA polymerase from certain gene promoters, right? So what we're gonna see is that transcription factors can either activate or inhibit gene expression. Transcription factors, again, have everything to do with how all of our cells have different gene expression profiles. All of our cells have the same genes for the most part, but they all have different transcription factors present. Therefore, in each cell type, RNA polymerase will be told to express different subsets of genes. So in a heart cell, I'm gonna speak very simply here, in a heart cell, there are heart transcription factors 
that will tell RNA polymerase to only go to the heart genes to make heart proteins. In a skin cell, there are skin transcription factors in the nucleus that tell RNA polymerase to only make the skin-related genes. The heart genes are still in the skin cell, but there are no heart transcription factors in a skin cell. So RNA polymerase will not transcribe heart-related genes in a skin cell. So I hope that makes sense um, briefly. So how do transcription factors work? Remember, we have, um, here's a template strand of um, DNA. So RNA polymerase is going to recognize this strand and start transcribing this bottom strand. It does so by binding to the promoter. But RNA polymerase doesn't just hop on a promoter. It actually has to recognize transcription factors first. So general transcription factors have to bind what's called the Tata box, part of the promoter called the Tata box. So transcription factor proteins bind to the Tata box at the promoter, and that's a signal for RNA polymerase to come along and start transcription. So we needed the DNA to be loosely wrapped, first of all. This DNA has to be loosely wrapped around histones. Second, transcription factors had to have been present. And when transcription factors are present, then RNA polymerase can come along and it'll be told, okay, this is a gene that you need to transcribe because this is a gene that needs to be expressed in this cell. So that's what we spoke about so far. Out of promoter, um, general transcription factors like top top binding proteins bind to the promoter. Gene expression could be increased even more by the presence of certain transcription factors. Transcriptional activators are certain kinds of transcription factors that bind to special DNA sequences called enhancers. Enhancers are DNA sequences that are located far from the promoter, usually very much upstream the promoter. And so again, these are very, very far. So far back that sometimes the DNA may have to bend over. So we're gonna see how transcription factors bind to the enhancer, but they have to, the DNA has to bend over. So the transcription factors can interact with the other transcription factors at the promoter. The end result of activators binding to enhancer sequences is increased transcription by RNA polymerase. So if we want extra expression, then certain activator transcription factors will bind to the enhancer sequences of DNA, which are located far away from the gene sometimes, and together that will form a complex that will increase transcription of that gene. Similarly, you don't have to know this uh, in too much detail, but there are repressor proteins that bind to silencer DNA sequences that would prevent RNA polymerase from binding the promoter. We saw that example in prokaryotes, but the, the LAC repressor, right? That repressor prevented RNA polymerase from making those um, lactose digesting enzymes. So together, transcription factors work in a very complicated process of activation and repression. For RNA polymerase to successfully bind to a eukaryotic promoter and initiate transcription, a set of proteins called transcription factors must first assemble on the promoter. The assembly process begins upstream from the transcription start site, where proteins called basal factors bind to a short TATA sequence in the promoter. Other basal factor proteins then bind, eventually forming a full transcription factor complex able to capture the RNA polymerase. Basal factors are essential for transcription, but cannot by themselves increase or decrease its rate. A second set of transcription factors, called coactivators, link the basal factors with a third set of transcription factor proteins called activators. Activators are regulatory proteins that bind to sequences on DNA called enhancers. Enhancers are located at sites that are distant from the promoter. The interaction of activator proteins with transcription factor subunits increases the rate of transcription. Many enhancers, scattered around the chromosome, can bind different activators, which provide a variety of responses to various signals. 
When a second kind of regulatory protein called a repressor binds to a silencer sequence located adjacent to or overlapping an enhancer sequence, the corresponding activator is no longer able to bind to the DNA. So let's just quickly review before moving forward. We know that first chromatin has to be at the right conformation, has to be um, exposed enough, has to be relaxed so that the promoter can be uh, exposed to RNA polymerase. If that's the case, then we have other transcription factors joining. Um, they can bind to enhancers or the promoter, and those help RNA polymerase transcribe the gene. And what tells um, transcription factors to turn genes on and off are usually signals on the outside of the cell. Remember that I mentioned signals on the outside, like hormones or other molecules can bind to receptors. When they bind to the receptors, those can transport transcription factors inside the nucleus to turn on or turn off certain genes. As an example, the ability to digest lactose right? Um, it talks about how genes can be turned on and off at different points in time. So all infants produce the enzyme lactase so they can break down lactose. But many adults are lactose intolerant because their lactase gene is turned off. We still have the gene, every single one of our cells. If you sequenced um, the DNA of any individual, any adult, they would have the lactase gene. But at a certain point, um, in development, right, after infanthood, then you don't need, to, or we didn't need historically, like thousands of years ago, um, we didn't need to, to produce lactase because we didn't eat dairy products um, after we nursed. It's only recently, um, relatively recently, after agriculture, where we started domesticating cows, where dairy is a part of our diet. And that's where regions of the Mediterranean, the Fertile Crescent, that relied on uh, agriculture and domestication of animals, uh, individuals that derive from those regions tend to be um, lactose tolerant, right? So whereas um, people of usually Asian descent uh, who have not had their ancestors exposed to dairy products do not express lactase after infanthood. So again, different genes get turned on and off at different points in time and also in different cell types. So just to recap, what is an enhancer made out of? So pause here. And the answer is DNA. Remember, DNA, um, the enhancer is a, a gene sequence. It's a sequence of DNA that's far away from the promoter. What is an activator not made out of? An activator is a type of transcription factor, which is a protein, and proteins are made up of amino acids. The answer is C. So you can watch the video contained in the ebook to recap. And just to refresh our memories, let's see. Would a heart cell have heart genes? Yes. Would it have heart transcription factors? Yes, right? That's what allows those heart genes to be made into heart proteins. Does a heart cell have skin genes? Yes. Does a heart cell have skin transcription factors? No, right? Would it have muscle genes? Yes. Would it make muscle proteins? Only if they're specific to the heart, so no. So would it make housekeeping proteins? Yes. So again, you can just um, check these out and make sure you understand how transcription factors are specific to different cell types. And those would then help turn on those specific genes required for that cell. And that's how cells become differentiated. So after transcription is complete, there is still control over gene expression. So post-transcriptional control operates on the mRNA transcript that has not been processed yet. And we know that splicing determines the type of mature transcript that leaves the nucleus. And we also said processing like cap and tail, can control the speed of mRNA transport from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. So these things, again, impact gene expression. So first, 
which mRNAs get processed. We know one gene can actually encode multiple proteins if different combinations of exons are included in the final mRNA. So a single mRNA transcript may have alternate ways of being spliced. So for example, both the hypothalamus in the brain and the thyroid gland produce a hormone called calcitonin. But the mRNA that leaves the nucleus is not the same in both types of cells. So there's variations, there's alternate ways you can include or exclude different exons. So this is called alternative splicing. Suppose that our normal gene has exons A, B, C, D, and E. So normally we would get an mRNA that has only these exons and we'd get one product. Suppose though that I did not include exon C. I would get a totally different um, arrangement of exons and that would give me a different protein product. So for an mRNA molecule with dozens of exons, the number of alternative proteins is huge. So there's a gene in fruit flies that can be spliced in more than 38,000 different configurations. And this is, again, this is telling us that just because we have 20 to 30,000 genes, we can make many, many more proteins, right? Just because you have one gene, it can give rise to more than one version of a protein. That's alternative splicing. So for a protein to be produced, mRNA must leave the nucleus and attach to a ribosome, right? If the mRNA doesn't leave and make it into the cytoplasm, the gene will not be expressed. And we know that the mRNA has to be protected um, with a special five prime cap and a three prime poly A tail for the mRNA to be stable so it can be translated. mRNA um, degrades, gets decayed once the cap or tail is removed. So not all mRNA molecules are equally stable. Some are rapidly destroyed, and some are very, very stable when they need to be translated from many times over. All right, so the, the size of the tail impacts gene expression levels. All right, so gene transcripts have different survival rates in different cell types as well. Um, mRNAs can be destroyed by enzymes when they're no longer needed in the cell. This can be done by enzymes called ribonucleases. Um, also, mRNAs can be degraded uh, with small, tiny RNA sequences called microRNAs. And each microRNA is only about 21 nucleotides long, but it actually interferes with translation when a small RNA binds to the mRNA. We'll talk a lot more about that later when we talk about biotechnology, because now small RNAs are being used as a therapeutic to shut off certain genes. After the protein is fully made, translated, gene expression is still regulated. Right? Proteins are modified as they get processed by the endomembrane system. So as they go from ribosome to gold, um, ribosome, the rough endoplasmic reticulum to the Golgi, certain sugars and lipids are added. These are called post-translational modifications. And like I mentioned, sometimes the protein has to fold in complex ways and be cut in certain ways. So these all impact whether the gene will be properly expressed. This is all after translation. Dozens of modifications are possible of these kinds of things, right? Um, and once fully functional, proteins could be active in the cell. Um, and again, proteins have to be located in the right um, destination um, as well. So the Golgi apparatus has a role in sorting proteins to their proper destination. If they're not in the right place, the gene won't be properly expressed. Finally, just like mRNAs, proteins don't always remain stable in the cell. So proteins can be activated by kinases, a kinase is an enzyme that adds a phosphate to a protein, usually activating it. Um, also, we have proteins being constantly degraded by enzymes called proteases. And there are these protein shredding tunnels in our cytoplasm called the proteasome. And if the protein is being um, is damaged or no longer needed, special molecules are added called ubiquitin. And this is like the kiss of death. Once these molecules are on this protein, it's doomed. And it goes through this protein shredding tunnel and it gets fragmented into pieces. So just as a recap, kinases are temporarily turning proteins on 
by adding a phosphate group. A phosphatase can temporarily shut off a protein by removing a phosphate group. So these are nature, nature's on and off switches for temporarily turning proteins on and off. So I'd like you to watch the summary video uh, contained in the ebook that will review all the means of gene expression control in eukaryotes. The last part of this talk will be on gene mutations. And a mutation is a change in a cell's DNA sequence. So it's like a typo in the genetic instructions. For example, over here, we have what's called a wild type fly. This is we call the wild type, uh, the normal, uh, that represents the majority of organisms. Normally, you would have antennae over here. However, this mutant fly is growing the legs where it should have had its antennae. So this is an example of a mutation. This is actually a mutant in a transcription factor. Instead of uh, antenna transcription factors being present, there were leg transcription factors by the eyes, and that caused legs to grow by the eyes in this fly. And the effects of a gene mutation could range from being harmless, or it could completely inactivate a protein. All right, so the same idea as like a typo could be innocuous, like you could just read past a word with a typo in it, or a typo can turn the word to something totally unrecognizable. And there are two ways that mutations can occur. A mutation can occur in sex cells, meaning in sperm or egg. Those are called germline mutations. So a germline mutation is a DNA sequence change that occurs in cells that give rise to sperm and eggs. These are heritable, meaning they can be passed down to the next generation because at least some of the sex cells that an organism that that organism produces will have that mutation. All right, so this, if this egg has a mutation, that means every single cell that comes from this zygote, which is the fertilized egg, will have that mutation, including the ovaries or the testes of this individual, which means that that initial mutation could be passed on. So those kinds of mutations um, run in families. Somatic mutations are um, occur in body cells. So most mutations do not pass from generation to generation. So somatic cells occur in non-sex cells. So like skin cells, lung cells, uh, for example. So all cells derived from that one altered one will also have the mutation, but it doesn't um, allow that organism to pass on the mutation. So for example, the children of a cigarette smoker with mutations that cause lung cancer will not inherit the parent's damaged genes because that was only done to the parent's lung tissue, not to their ovaries or sperm. So a mutation can happen after sperm and egg fuse and then only subsets of cells will be affected. If it happens early in development, then patches of the body of the organism will be affected by that mutation. Mutations can be induced or they can be spontaneous. A spontaneous mutation is a result from a DNA replication error by DNA polymerase. So DNA polymerase is the enzyme that copies DNA. And a spontaneous mutation can happen if there's a replication error. Right? So the average rate of replication error is about 1 in 100,000. Um, but it, it varies between gene to gene. And mispairing would usually get corrected. So there's, um, DNA polymerase has a proofreading ability. But if this doesn't get corrected, there can be a spontaneous mutation. It's also possible for genes to jump from one location to another. Um, for example, transposons uh, or transposable element is a DNA sequence that can jump within the genome. And that could insert itself randomly into chromosomes and disrupt a gene, gene's function spontaneously. An induced mutation is caused by a mutagen, which is a chemical um, such as radiation or an organic chemical that can damage DNA. So an example of that would be like UV light, uh, x-rays, uh, tobacco, right? Those things induce, they cause a mutation. They can cause a switch in a nucleotide 
Um, or they can cause certain nucleotides to um, deform in certain ways, to form different hydrogen bonds uh, that they shouldn't make. So there's a test called the Ames test for mutagenicity, and I'll talk about that very, very quickly. Um, basically, normally bacteria require an amino acid called histidine in order to grow. Let's say I want to test this new paint, or actually let me use a new flavoring. It's a new uh, artificial flavoring um, that I want to make sure it doesn't uh, change DNA. It doesn't have the ability to be mutagenic. So the AIMS test takes two strains of bacteria that normally require the amino acid histidine. They expose one tube of the bacteria to my new artificial flavor where the control is left alone. I then plate each of those bacteria onto plates that lack histidine. And again, normally cells, bacteria cells would not be able to grow without histidine. However, if you mutate bacteria, they are able to grow even without histidine. So what this means is, if you see that bacteria still grow without histidine, when you expose them to your artificial flavor, that means your artificial flavor is a mutagen. It was able to mutate the bacteria, allowing them to grow on this plate without histidine. Where normally, without the exposure of that artificial flavor, bacteria would not be able to grow without histidine. So this is a way that companies test new chemicals to see if they can mutate DNA. So let's talk about specific types of mutations. And a point mutation is when one base is switched. So in the case of a substitution, right, that's when one nucleotide is switched to another. And this could be, this could have very different results depending on it. So we said mutations could have very different uh, results overall. If you want to continue with the cookbook analogy, like the cookbook has recipes for different uh, dishes to make. So if there's a typo in one of the recipes, that could have no effect at all. Like you wouldn't even notice a difference in the flavor. However, some typos might tell you to put five cups of salt instead of five teaspoons of salt. And that could have a very bad effect. Some possible typos can actually be beneficial. So maybe by adding extra vanilla extract accidentally, that actually improves the flavor. Same thing happens with mutations. They could have no effect, they could have a bad effect, or in rare cases, they could have a very positive effect. So suppose uh, my DNA has 3' prime ATG 5'. Prime. That would encode for the codon of mRNA 5' prime UAC. If I were to look that up in a codon table, I would see that that encodes for tyrosine. A missense mutation is when an amino acid is switched to another amino acid. So let's see what happens in that case. Versus a nonsense mutation, is when an amino acid is switched to a stop codon. So again, you have two types of substitution mutations, or actually like, um, you could have one that's, or three types, one that's kind of harmless, no mutation at all. You could have a missense mutation where an amino acid is switched to another amino acid, or you could have a nonsense mutation where an amino acid is, stopped, is switched to a stop codon. So let's see what happens. If I switch this ATG to ATA, that means my coda would be UAU, but that would still give me tyrosine, so that's harmless. If I switch the G to a C, that would give me a UAG codon, which actually encodes for a stop codon. That would cut my protein short and likely have very bad consequences. Let's say I switch this G, or this A to a G, that would cause my codon to be CAC, and that would give me a totally different amino acid of histidine. That could make my whole protein faulty. So if we look back at hemoglobin and sickle cell anemia, we had a substitution. A single point mutation from T to A caused uh, an amino acid substitution from glutamic acid to valine. And that has very, very catastrophic effects on not only um, hemoglobin, not only red blood cells, but the entire body. A frame shift mutation is different from a substitution. 
A frame shift mutation is when one or two nucleotides are either added or removed from DNA. And when you add one or two nucleotides or remove one or two nucleotides, that shifts the reading frame of all of the remaining codons. This is really bad. So a frame shift mutation always makes the protein non-functional. Suppose I have this sentence of three letter words, the cat ate the rat. Every three letters, I divide them up, right? Just like codons, they get divided up in three letters. Suppose I just delete one letter, the C, and then I divide up everything into threes. Well, I have a totally different sentence that I can't even read, right? The ata tet her app doesn't tell me anything because by removing one letter, everything shifted over. If I were to add a letter, same thing would happen. It would make the sentence illegible. So normally we start breaking up the DNA bases into every three, you know, three codons. Every three nucleotides is a codon. But a frame shift of one DNA base will give us an abnormal amino acid sequence. So a frame shift mutation always renders the DNA, uh, the gene non-functional. So we can see over here where normally you would get these amino acids in the protein. If you add a base, what's going to happen is a totally different arrangement of amino acids will be translated. So please watch this video in the ebook. So to summarize, Here's a normal sequence of amino acids. If I substitute with a point, um, at a point mutation, do a substitution, I could have a different amino acid put in. With the addition or deletion, that causes a frame shift in all subsequent amino acids. And that will affect not only this one amino acid, but all of the protein. So here's an example of a substitution if this is our sentence, for a missense mutation, you would basically switch one of the letters. In a nonsense substitution, that would cause a stop codon, so that would interrupt your sentence short. An insertion, if it's three letters, is not that bad, because you're just adding in one amino acid. So it could change the sentence, like it could change the protein, like the wet fly, but overall, I can still read everything beyond it. If I were to add one or two um, nucleotides, that would be a frame shift. By adding just a Q, that would cause everything else to be illegible. It's also sometimes possible that DNA polymerase makes mistakes and keeps on repeating three letters. These are called expanded repeats. Um, and this happens in diseases like Huntington's, where they have repeats of glutamines over and over and over again. And because of this mistake of repeats, uh, it causes the proteins to misfold, uh, which can have drastic consequences on the nervous system. So pause here and answer this question now. So the answer is C, a frame shift mutation would have the worst outcome for an organism. So here I'm giving you an original sequence and then a mutated sequence. I want you to pause here and tell me what would happen to them two amino acids. Would both amino acids change by this mutation, but only one change, or would neither change? So pause here and do this out in your notes. This is a good practice problem. Okay, so let's do this together. The original sequence would be A, G, T, T, C, T. So let's transcribe that. So we know that the RNA would be U, C, A, A, G, A, three prime. And then let's look at the codon table, right? This is five prime to three prime. It's in RNA, so we could use the codon table. So U, C, A, U, C, A, and codes for serine. So this one is serine. I should also note that when we're writing amino acid sequences, um, it's good to abbreviate the beginning with an N prime 
for the amino end. Remember, all amino acids are all proteins start with an amino end and end with a carboxyl end. That's just the orientation of amino acids. So if we write protein sequences, we usually start with an N prime for the amino end, and we end with a C prime for the carboxyl end. So AGA, let's look up AGA, gives us arginine. So this original sequence gives us the amino acids, serine, and then arginine. Now let's look at the mutated sequence. The mutated sequence gives us a different mRNA transcript of C, C, A, A, G, G. So now let's look up C, C, A. So C, C, A gives us proline this time. So now our mutated sequence starts with a proline. And now A, G, G, let's look A, G, G, still gives us arginine. So what is the answer? Are both amino acids changed, only one or neither? Right, the answer is B. The arch stayed the same with these two codons, but this A to G mutation but which was A to G, caused there to be a substitution, a missense mutation. So finally, we'll discuss um, the results of mutations. We said these mutations could result in a loss of function of a protein. And if a faulty enzyme is inserted into a metabolic pathway, a person may be unable to convert one molecule to another with serious consequences. So for example, in the disorder of phenylketonuria, Phenylalanine builds up in the system, and that could have um, intellectual uh, disabilities in the patient. So without the enzyme to break down phenylalanine, you can get a disorder. So you don't want to have a mutation in the enzyme that breaks down phenylalanine. But you could also um, have very good consequences from mutations. And after all, mutations are what drive genetic diversity. Right? Mutations allow evolution, things to choose from. Right? Mutations allow for diversity. With more diversity, nature has more to select from in natural selection. So genetic variation is very important for evolution. And specifically, looking at this grapefruit and cotton and this wheat, they were actually purposely irradiated with radiation to create mutants. So they could then select from the best of those mutants. They can get the sweetest, biggest grapefruits and the most fluffy uh, cotton produced. So again, mutations can drive um, positive um, adaptations and positive traits that could be selected from. So mutations are not always harmful. So that brings us to the end of chapter seven. We said DNA consists of nucleotides, as does RNA. DNA undergoes transcription, in which DNA is copied into RNA. Okay. RNA has three types. We said rRNA is a component of ribosomes. tRNA can carry amino acids to the ribosomes. And mRNA is divided into codons. mRNA undergoes translation at a ribosome to assemble a protein, right? DNA encodes all proteins, and proteins are made up of amino acids. And we know that genetic code describes the correspondence between mRNA codons and the amino acids of a protein. So that is the end of chapter seven. Thank you for listening, and I will see you next time for chapter eight.